The following lecture is brought to you by the Boot Camp Subcommittee of the Committee on Resident Education of the Society of Neurological Surgeons. The objectives of this lecture are to cover the following principles. The Monroe Kelly Doctrine, Normal and Pathological ICP, Indications for ICP Monitoring according to the TBI Guidelines, Normal and Pathological CPP, which varies by age, and ICP Management Therapies. The Monroe Kelly Doctrine, written in Edinburgh in 1783, states that the cranium is a rigid box and its total volume remains constant. As such, increases in the volume of the cranial compartments, brain, blood, and or CSF, will elevate intracranial pressure. In addition, if one of these three compartments increases in volume, it must occur at the expense of volume of the other two elements. In short, according to the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, increased ICP may be understood as the result of an attempt to force excess volume into a rigid container filled with three compartments. Why is intracranial pressure important? Because it is a treatable cause of neurological decline. Clinicians must be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of elevated ICP. To that end, the following question arises. What would be the clinical cost of loss of volume from each of the three compartments? The answer lies in looking for progressive neurological signs, looking at the three compartments at risk, and determining the effect of loss of volume from each. The principles of ICP treatment include the standard ABCs of resuscitation, maintenance of cerebral perfusion, avoidance of brain distortion, and limitation of brain edema. When calculating the cerebral metabolic requirements, one may estimate that cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption equals cerebral blood flow multiplied by the arteriovenous difference of oxygen. Cerebral autoregulation is an important topic and has three major principles. Metabolic, meaning that CBF is proportional to brain demands. Pressure, meaning that CBF remains unchanged despite changes in blood pressure, intracranial pressure, or both. And viscosity, meaning that CBF remains unchanged despite changes in blood viscosity. Keeping it simple, cerebral autoregulation occurs by virtue of adjusting the diameter of resistance vessels. CO2 reactivity is another important concept. With hypercarbia, typically secondary to hypoventilation, cerebral vessels dilate and CBF becomes elevated. With hypocarbia, typically secondary to hyperventilation, cerebral vessels constrict and CBF is reduced. Hyperventilation may be used as a short-term therapy for elevated ICP. As stated previously, hyperventilation lowers CO2 levels, pH increases, and vasoconstriction occurs thereby lowering cerebral blood volume and intracranial pressure rapidly. This maneuver is for the acute period only, however, as preventative hyperventilation retards recovery from severe head injury. Any hyperventilation is ideally accompanied by some form of monitoring of cerebral oxygenation, and in the absence of such monitoring, hyperventilation is used only as a last step in ICP control and always with sufficient arterial blood pressure. Mannitol is another therapy used to decrease high intracranial pressure and brain bulk during surgery. It also improves CBF by decreasing viscosity. Compensatory vasoconstriction secondary to autoregulation then occurs, bringing CBF back to baseline along with diminished cerebral blood volume 
and intracranial pressure. Guidelines for the management of severe traumatic brain injury were developed by the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and the Brain Trauma Foundation. In the most recent edition, levels of recommendation were changed from standard guidelines and options to level one, level two, and level three, respectively. Recommendation levels one, two, and three are derived from class one, two, and three evidence, respectively. As a review, class one constitutes prospective randomized control trials, the gold standard of clinical trials. Class two constitutes clinical trials in which reliable data were collected prospectively and analyzed retrospectively. Class three constitutes studies based upon retrospectively collected data, case review and reports, and expert opinion. The indications for intracranial pressure monitoring are as follows. Level one recommendations do not exist. Level two recommendations state that ICP should be monitored in all salvageable patients with a severe TBI and an abnormal computed tomography scan. An abnormal CT scan is one that reveals hematoma, contusion, swelling, herniation, or compressed basal cisterns. Level three recommendations state that ICP monitoring is indicated with severe TBI and a normal CAT scan if two or more of the following features are noted at admission. Age greater than 40 years, unilateral or bilateral motor posturing, or systolic blood pressure less than 90. This chart summarizes the level one, two, and three recommendations for ICP monitoring and ICP management. The indications for ICP monitoring we previously reviewed. The ICP threshold for initiating treatment are as follows. Level two recommendations being that treatment should be initiated for ICPs greater than 20. Level three recommendations being that treatment should be based upon a combination of ICP values and clinical and brain CT findings. ICP monitoring technology has advanced over time. A ventricular catheter is the most accurate, low cost, and reliable method of monitoring intracranial pressure. It also can be recalibrated in situ. ICP transduction via fiber optic or micro strain gauge devices placed in ventricular catheters provide similar benefits but at a higher cost. Parenchymal ICP monitors cannot be recalibrated during monitoring. Subarachnoid, subdural, and epidural monitors are less accurate. The GCS score is a standardized and well-recognized scoring system for evaluating a patient's neurologic status. Residents should be familiar with its components and various grades. Cerebral perfusion pressure equals mean arterial pressure less intracranial pressure. In terms of CPP thresholds requiring treatment, there are no level one recommendations. Level two recommendations are to avoid aggressive attempts to maintain CPP greater than 70 with fluids and pressors due to the risk of ARDS. Level three recommendations are to avoid CPP values less than 50. Thus, the target CPP parameters are typically understood to be between 50 and 70. The guidelines for the management of severe TBI include ICP management protocols. In general, ICP is managed in a stepwise progression, with treatment being escalated to the next level based upon a goal ICP of less than 20 and CPP of 50 to 70. The steps include CSF drainage, sedation, paralysis, hyperosmolar therapy, 
hyperventilation, hypothermia, barbiturates, and finally decompressive craniectomy. CPP is also managed in a stepwise progression with treatment being escalated to the next level based upon a goal of 50 to 70. The steps include ICP control, euvolemia or hypervolemia, and finally pressor therapy. It is important to verify the recorded ICP. First check the EVD to be patent. Next check the waveform to be present and adequate. Finally, check to see if the EVD ICP correlates with the intraparenchymal monitor if present. It is also important to maintain 30 degrees of head elevation and adequate venous return by loosening the cervical collar if applicable. In general, open the EVD for ICPs greater than 20 for 10 minutes and then close and transduce ICP. Repeat once and proceed to ICP stepwise therapy if ICP is greater than 20 when an EVD is open at 15. Sedation is critical when treating ICP. Propofol is a commonly used agent but requires electrolyte monitoring. Once the maximal dose of propofol has been reached, fentanyl may be started in combination to reach required sedation and ICP control. The role of hypothermia remains controversial. There are no level one or two recommendations on this topic. Level three recommendations from pooled data indicate that prophylactic hypothermia is not beneficial when compared with normal thermic controls. Prophylactic hypothermia is considered body temperature below 37.5. Hyperosmolar therapy is useful in ICP management. There are no level one recommendations. Level two recommendations suggest mannitol is effective for controlling raised ICP, while level three recommendations suggest using mannitol without ICP monitoring only in herniating patients. Hypertonic saline can also lower ICP and improve hemodynamics, proving useful in those with systemic hypotension. Hyperosmolar therapy may be initiated with a 3% hypertonic saline bolus of 250 cc's, being sure to check the serum sodium level beforehand. Mannitol may be used in emergency situations. Being sure at this point when using mannitol to check sodium and serum osmolality. A 3% saline drip may be started next. Again, sodium and osmolality must be followed. Avoid a sodium greater than 160, osmolality greater than 320, and sodium elevations greater than 10 over a 24-hour period. Hyperventilation may be useful in very specific circumstances. There are no level one recommendations regarding this maneuver. Level two recommendations argue against prophylactic hyperventilation. Level three recommendations suggest hyperventilation may be used as a temporizing measure for severe refractory ICP. Furthermore, Hyperventilation should be avoided in the first 24 hours after injury. In short, hyperventilation should be utilized as illustrated on this slide. If ICP remains elevated and refractory to medical management, it is critical to perform a STAT head CT to evaluate for structural mass lesions. As a last resort, when ICP remains elevated despite maximal medical therapy, consider surgery for a decompressive hemicraniectomy or bilateral frontal craniectomy. Here is a case example. 27-year-old patient after an ATV accident. He arrived intubated 
eyes closed with only lower extremity movement. CAT scan revealed a right frontal contusion, sulcal effacement, and signs of cerebral edema. Patient was taken for decompressive craniectomy. Here are the post-op images. Here are the post-op images following replacement of the bone flap. Barbiturate induced coma may be used for elevated ICP. There are no level one recommendations for the use of these agents. Level two recommendations argue against prophylactic barbiturate use and high dose barbiturate administration only recommended in those patients with elevated ICP that is refractory to maximal medical and surgical treatment. Seizure prophylaxis is typically administered in TBI patients. As level two recommendations suggest, anticonvulsants decrease the incidence of early post-traumatic seizures.